Good afternoon, everyone. How are you doing? We, I think we're going to start because it's already 3.10. The room feels so much emptier, especially with the gateways um, artwork off of the walls. And it, not only does it look um, different, it, to me it feels different. And I didn't realize how much of an impact that those images had on the space when I walked in here this afternoon and they were gone. <laughs> so um, I don't know who's next up in the queue of putting artwork up on the walls, but we definitely need to, to get more artwork up there. But we also cannot forget that the message that those images from those incarcerated youth that were up here over the last two months were intended for and meant to accomplish. Um, and hopefully we can see those students in this exact room, but in 3D and in real life and not in 2D on, on the walls. So again, thank you for coming today. I don't think I need a microphone. It feels super loud. I, I appreciate the, the loudness. Um, and I hope that folks fill in the seats as the talk goes on today, or at least gather um, to form a tighter knit community because, it, because after all, this is titled Coming Together, a speaker series and not spread apart. So, <laughs> um, so if some folks um, didn't know, um, Evergreen lost um, a founding faculty member um, over this weekend, the only black founding faculty member that there, there was um, about from, from 45 years ago. His name is Rudy Martin, and this is his picture um, up, up on the screen. And <clears throat> I had a couple of opportunities to, to meet Rudy over the years and to listen to his wisdom and his experience of what it was like in those early days of Evergreen when they were trying to do something that wasn't being accomplished anywhere else in terms of supporting students and addressing the needs of a society that typically weren't addressed in um, standard school. So I went on to the Evergreen Archives and looked at Rudy Martin's webpage. And on that webpage, he was speaking about why he came to Evergreen. And I believe this was probably something that was written the first, within the first 10 years of him being here. And he talked about <clears throat> his, his traditional education, and he talked about his, his lived education. And he went in to talk about um, the type of jobs that he had and the type of change that he tried to make in terms of, of our own race and equity. And I'm gonna read you four short passages from that, that, those writings of Rudy's online. And I'll start with this one which doesn't sound positive, but it, it, sets, it's, it sets the stage for the following ones. I was fired from my first teaching job for political actions that were abhorrent to the power figures I was supposed to be working for. On my next job, I was labeled a, a young Turk because I knew when, when to say what and when to, and to whom. I chose instead to say what I felt, thought, and believed. He later went on to say, I knew something about how to learn, but I didn't know much. I worked with students for 10 or 12 years, but I always ended up teaching myself more than I ever taught anyone else. I became convinced that contact and enlightening, i.e. process, mattered in learning. Institutional bureaucracy didn't. I tempered that conviction with the belief that unless man fundamentally altered his institutions, any kind of prof any kind, any kind of survival that mattered was impossible, and I'm profoundly ambivalent about the likelihood of, of him doing that. But that great stone has to be pushed back up the hill yet again, so I, so I had to come here to Evergreen. I came here to teach and learn in hopes that I'll find others, regardless of rank or title, who are like-minded. So far, I managed to find some of them, and I expect to find more. If they and I stop finding each other, 
If the lightning goes, so will I. So if you would like to read the whole text, that could be found in um, Rudy Martin's webpage and archives. So can we take a moment of silence um, to recognize Rudy, um, his, his, his efforts and energy to get this to a place that we all still aspire for it to be. Hey, thank you. So as we go into this fifth talk or workshop of the speaker series, please keep his words in mind. And also to recognize how much far we still have to go. Because the last time I heard him speak at Ever Return to Evergreen um, in the fall, he talked about what it was like in the early 70s. And I was like, dang, that's really what it was like? And then I thought, like, what happened? So here we are, and where, at least I felt, I'm feeling where we are, is like, what happened? And then I'm projecting out 40 years from now. And if there seemed to be such great promise and momentum for this place to be what, it, what everybody that wanted change thought it could be, and that ball to get pushed up the hill one more time, we're not even at the bottom of the hill, right? So we got a lot of pushing to do. So we're going to continue this into the spring. And we're trying to confirm up some, some speakers and some dates so that this doesn't just become a good little program for the winter, but that's something that continues to build the, the foundation and the momentum for us to develop a policy, a plan for our campus, so that we can get the ball up the hill, but we need as many people as we can to push it. And as soon as those people are confirmed and those dates are confirmed, we will, we will definitely send that out. But there's DOA, Day of Absence, and there's Day of Presence that is coming up in week two. And it's going to be a jam-packed week and lots of opportunities to re-engage in, in this conversation. And I would hope that everybody will, will be there in, in attendance. So Robin's here for our third talk. And I would like to bring Robin back up, up to, the, to the stage. And today is going to be a pretty interactive day, at least to the best of, of my knowledge. And I'll be handing out some, some flyers, not flyers, scenarios. Do you want them handed out? Do you want me to hand them out now, Robin? Or? Okay, so it's distracting. So <clears throat> I did have something else planned for this, this welcoming, but I thought it was fitting um, to honor um, Rudy Martin. So thank you all for your attendance and, and welcome Robin D'Angelo. Thank you. I understand it's a really intense time of the term also, so I appreciate all of those people who are here. Um, so this is my third visit, and the first one I, I mapped out uh, the water as I see it. The water is whiteness. Uh, the water is white supremacy. That's the, the frame. Um, I like that metaphor of water, right? Picture the fish in water and where we benefit from systems of oppression. It's as if we're in a current and we don't even realize there's a current, right? And when we swim against the current, we're really acutely aware of the current. But what's... Um, What's the bowl, if you will? So, you know, it's not just the water and then the fish in the water, but there's the whole container or structure. Um, and so the first uh, time I was here, I mapped that out, and I try really hard to make it recognizable, right? What does it look like in our lives? Um, we're taught to see racism as individual acts uh, that only some people 
um, participate in, and as long as we don't intentionally participate in them, we're exempt, right? That's the dominant narrative, and if we do, uh, intentionally participate in them, then we're bad people, which is why most of us get really defensive at any suggestion that we participate in them. So I spent time trying to kind of change that paradigm and to understand that it is the water. Uh, there is no avoiding it. Uh, we all collude with it, but of course with different results. That collusion benefits uh, those of us who are white and of course does not benefit those who are people of color. Um, and then the second time I came, I talked about white fragility, which is my concept of uh, how our socialization sets white people up to respond really poorly to challenges to our racial positions, worldviews, or advantages. And those challenges can come in direct feedback, either from people of color or from other white people, but they can also come in challenges to very cherished ideologies, right? A challenge to individualism. Uh, a cha you know, a challenge to meritocracy, a challenge to white centrality, right? And I've been thinking about that one a lot lately because it often manifests in um, organizations trying to sponsor uh, ongoing work because they recognize that it's ongoing, that you're never finished, uh, that 24-7 the forces around us push and seduce and compel us to, to participate, and the only way to not collude is to actively, intentionally, and strategically seek to resist those forces. And as soon as we're complacent, you know, we get sucked back in. And the kind of resentment uh, that a lot of white folks feel about having to do this, <laughs> uh, for me, is also a challenge to white centrality, white entitlement, white comfort. And, and so all of the ways we tend to respond when those things get challenged, and even though I'm using the term fragility, I don't want to suggest that it's a form of weakness because it really does function to, to bully the challenge off and get us back into the norm, our equilibrium, and kind of in, back into the center and into kind of our comfort zones. So, so this time, and I was hoping to be able to move around amongst you and not be, but just so you know, this is, uh, there's no portable mic, so <laughs> that's why I gotta stand up here at the podium. But um, I wanted to make it, um, a little more a applicable to, to here at Evergreen, okay? And so I'm, I'm thinking of this in term, I forget it's right down here. Um, microaggressions, both, both the kind of small, and of course small doesn't mean the impact is small, but those moments, right, that occur, and of course the larger picture of, and we could call that a ma macroaggression. And Eduardo Bonilla Silva, who I adore, uh, his book is Racism Without Racists. He's a sociologist from Duke, and um, you know his, his argument in that book is, gee, nobody's racist anymore, and of course we still have racism, so what's going on? Um, he talks about HWCU, so, so what are those? <laughs> Historically white colleges and universities. And that's just one of the reasons I love him is he just kind of flips that. So if you've ever heard of HBCU, uh, it's historically black colleges and universities. Um, and he's saying, well then, it's kind of like, why are all the black kids sitting together in the, in the cafeteria? Like, where are other folks sitting, you know, and um, what, what, he's, he's pushing against this um, dominant narrative to only name race when it's people of color, right, and to, and to constantly position whiteness as universal and neutral, right? So um, that's what I thought I would talk about today and give you a lot of time to discuss. We're kind of a relatively small crowd um, compared to our other two sessions, so you'll have lots of time to talk in small groups, right? So I'm gonna intersperse, you know, some, some points and then let you, uh, talk it through. All right. So this is a quote from a, a, a black student protester uh, at the Missouri um, University system. You know that the president just recently uh, resigned. I don't think that as a white person, I don't think that you as a white person understand what it's like to walk past a building or be studying in a school or to have it on your diploma from a school that was built on the backs of and by your people. I don't want to see that. I don't want to sit in Wilcox Hall and enjoy my meal and look out at Woodrow Wilson, who would not have wanted me here. Right. So just an, an example of that of the of the water. 
right? And the ways that that taxes students of color very different, students and faculty and administration of color very differently than, than, it, uh, than it does white folks. So all of these examples I've adapted from Eduardo Bonillo Silva. He's got a really, really fun Facebook, a Facebook a blog that he writes, so I urge you to check it out, where he, he was um, frustrated with the kinds of upset a lot of white faculty that he works with um, had about the president of Mizzou University resigning in the face of his inability to, uh, with any kind of um, competency, <laughs> address the racial tensions on that campus, right? So first of all, most colleges uh, and universities are white-oriented and led. Uh, and the whiteness is reproduced through the curriculum, the culture, the demography, symbols, traditions, and ecology. Those won't necessarily be visible to those of us that they're normal to, but again, the, the water. And, and I'm arguing, or he's, he's arguing, that the, the container affects us. Right? Notice that nobody has to do anything. The very environment, the psychic weight of being one of a few, of having to represent your group, of succeeding or failing and having it represent your group, um, where white students don't have that toil, right? If they succeed or fail, it's on their own perceived merits and not on their, on their race. Uh, this, uh, the assumption that a white space is racially neutral Right? That if it feels welcoming to us, it feels welcoming to everybody, that there's nothing happening unless a racial incident happens. And of course, a racial incident is generally defined as something a white person recognizes as racial, right? Of course, recognizes as a racial and then grants that it's problematic. <laughs> um, and most white people see um, isolated incidents rather than patterns. That's another way, right, that racism operates on campuses. We, people of color see it as patterns, right? This is just one example of myriad, myriad everyday examples. And for white folks, we tend to see it as an isolated incident and we respond as if it's an isolated incident, right? Uh, admission of people of color into HWCUs is not integration, a concept that co requires much more than spatial cohabitation. All right, so he's saying just including people, this is why there's a lot of emphasis on the difference between equity and equality, right? Equality generally is equal, so you get to be here too, but equity is that and what you need uh, will be addressed and it will be probably different than what somebody else needs. Right, so um, that just cohabiting does not free us, and this is this comes up a lot in uh, white folks feeling like if I have friends of color, I'm I'm clearly there's no issue here, right? I uh, because racism is conscious dislike, apparently a racist, or to have uh, if you have you couldn't possibly have any kind of deeply internalized racist viewpoints and tolerate a person of color, right? That's the dominant. Uh, idea, um, which is why so many white people give uh, e their evidence that they're not racist is their uh, proximity and friendliness towards people of color. Okay, um, people of color are seen as less qualified, whether whether that's conscious or not. And a lot of research is shows that the perception is that people of color are inherently unqualified. Right? So it doesn't really matter what we see in front of us in terms of qualifications and CVs. There's a very deeply internal, internal belief that they couldn't be. And this comes through in evaluations and assessments. Uh, the famous resume studies are a great example of that. Um, and that probably they just got their job because of a special program, um, less qualified. Also, there's threads of resentment that come through in, in that narrative, right? Um, that people of color on campuses have to deal with, people whose assumptions about why they're there, and then the resentments that are also not very far below the surface. Uh, if you think somebody got their job unfairly, you probably have some resentment that you, pro that you may be trying to keep a lid on, but that stuff comes out in, in kind of our, I think of it as coming out of our pores, right? Uh, people of color are blamed for the climate if, if racial tensions rise, right? They're playing the race card, they're over sensitive, they see race about everything. So this, this happens a lot. 
uh, in, in these kind of environments. Fit is used for code. Fit is code for um, is white or keeps white people comfortable. How many of uh, the people in the room are faculty? Okay, uh, you ever been on a hiring committee and have fit be uh, <laughs> like a huge point of, um, wow, I mean even if, even if uh, we weren't looking at the racist dimensions of fit, uh, it, I just think it's really problematic to want to have someone who fits into what's already there if indeed you want to get a, a wide range of perspectives and skills and all of that, but it, it's a... Um, there's ample evidence that people of color... Uh, let's see, where are we? Do not feel welcome and feel treated as second-class citizens in the academy, yet many uh, white faculty and administration uh, appear to be shocked to hear that. And, and again, whether you, you may genuinely be shocked to, you know, you haven't seen anything and you see yourself as open and welcoming and you've done everything you could, but your shock in itself is a microaggression. Does that make sense? Because it's that reminder that you don't have to know and you don't have to see, right? Um, College admissions are based on tests that are not reliable measures of how um, students of color are, you know, their ability to succeed. And I think we all know that, and yet we rely on them. And that might not be relevant here at Evergreen because you're an alternative school. Am I correct? Okay. What did I hear? Ah, okay. So it does it does weigh in, and yet not um, if you don't take into account so many aspects of, of tests. Um, that's going to definitely uh, penalize students of color. Um, faculty are hired based on their records, but how race or racism affects the productivity of whites positively and of non-whites negatively is not acknowledged. And Bonilla Silva talks a lot about the incredible, besides the, just the psychic weight of being so isolated on um, campuses that inherently feel hostile because you're so isolated, um, faculty of color have to take up the race work, right? And they, they have to be there for students of color and uh, they, get, they get called upon to be the token representatives on every committee and they get called on to consult. And I um, often see people of color automatically assume to be able to do the diversity committee or the diversity director or the diversity just because they're people of color, right? It might not be their interest, and it may not be their background, right? But automatically, you do the race work, and that w we do everything else <laughs> that's, that is seen as non-racialized. Um, statues, names of buildings, and traditions are emblems of whiteness, which makes us feel as if we don't belong. This is a quote from uh, Bonio Silva. Are there any statues here? Just curious. How about photos of the founders, <laughs> portraits, things like that? Have you ever seen those? You're in a bank or you're in a different kind of university and you walk down the hall and it's just not, it's, it's incredibly white and usually incredibly male, right? Yeah. Uh, most of the localities in which uh, HWCUs are located reproduce and reinforce whiteness. So there's also the, the communities or environments that these colleges are in, right? We're in, we're not even in a downtown Olympia, right? We're kind of in more the rural area of Olympia, okay? Um, and white folks tend to love places like that, and we, you know, we feel that they're so safe and sheltered, and that is so deeply uh, from a particular position, right? Uh, often the things that feel and those words are so problematic, but we use them a lot, right? What a, what a lovely, safe community, nobody locks their doors here, that type of thing. Those are usually exactly the kind of communities that don't feel safe for people of color, right? Uh, so faculty and students of color often do not feel welcome in their communities at large. And here's a quote from Benia Silva, how hard it is to deal with campus and city police or cops, how hard it is to go to a bar in your bucolic white town, right? So even living here, um, can be kind of a constant uh, trigger, if you will, right? A psychic kind of navigation. Uh, classrooms are hostile zones for most of us. If as students we raise concerns about the material used by our professors in the classes, and, and 
That's why I love Bonio Silva. He's a little bit snarky. Professor Blanco, uh, why are you not including African artists and artistic traditions in your world art history class? Um, and we're accused of trying to politicize things. If we're professors and dare suggest that racism is as American as apple pie, i.e. that it's structural, white students say we are calling them racist and making them feel bad. You don't know me, I am a good person. Is this um, recognizable to anybody? Okay. Right, and so there's a lot of pressure to keep white students comfortable. I, I'm always, um, honestly, um, saddened by how much more uh, energy the folks that often bring me in have to make sure white students feel welcome and comfortable and not made um, uncomfortable by conversations of race and how much energy is not there for what students of color are enduring. Um, and daily microaggressions have to be endured. If people of color talk about race, they're making white students feel bad or only seeing as focusing on race or having an agenda. I'm also taken aback. I mean, it's all I talk about. Um, I, won't, I will not take race off the table for anything. You want to talk about uh, trans issues or, or gender queer issues or class or anything else, we're going to do it through a racial lens. But I just, I don't recall ever being uh, accused or dismissed as focusing too much on race. But uh, professors of color, if they have one unit on race, it's seen as that's all you talked about or it's all you cared about, right? Uh, research shows that race and gender impact evaluations, yet evaluations are still weighted regardless of course content or instructor positionality. I think that's also really problematic. It doesn't matter. It's not taken into account that teaching something that is perceived as neutral, like what's perceived as neutral, uh, economics? <laughs> uh, <laughs> computer programming? All right. Um, uh, to teach that versus to teach a course on, you know, oppression or institutional inequality in the United States, those evaluations are weighted the same. Right, and, and that is so much more charged content. And then we also don't take into account, and what's the positionality of the person teaching it, right? Are evaluations weighted here? No, okay, I'm getting no's, that's good. At the same time, expected to carry the burden of race, uh, serve on committees, etc. cetera. I, think I mentioned that earlier. Um, White faculty often believe that they, if they are for social justice, they automatically do social justice. This is a little pet peeve of mine. My goodness, I teach at Evergreen, it's progressive, it's alternative, of course, I automatically do it. And um, I, would, I would argue that it, it, it does not happen automatically. It happens with a st strategy and intentionality. Um, and it's, it's not enough. This goes, up, this goes up against or reveals that narrative that to be an open person is to automatically support everybody. And I actually think, I actually think racism depends on white people being really, really nice to everybody and just carrying on. Right? Just be really nice and just carry on. Um, and nothing will change or get interrupted, and you will be supporting the default, uh, and the default is the reproduction of, of white, whiteness and white supremacy. So, so it doesn't mean don't be nice, <laughs> uh, but it means be critical, be conscious, be strategic, be intentional, be aware, and always be asking, um, to the best of my ability, what would be the most strategic way to engage right now, or the, or the question to ask, or the thing to put on the table, or the direction to go. Again, I won't get it right by everybody, but I'm always grappling with that. Right? And apathy, I, I see a lot, uh, a lot of apathy, right? Um, do you guys see any apathy in the faculty and administration on these topics, yeah. right? Okay. And again, that's not neutral. There's a lot of ways we rationalize the apathy. Um, I, I already know all this. <laughs> um, I already do this. It's not relevant to the course I teach, right? There's ways that, but, but really what it is, is is apathy that functions to protect the status quo, right? Okay. 
So what do student protesters want? This was gathered um, around uh, all the recent protests that have happened on college campuses. And the number one is increase the diversity of the professors. And that's why I think it's really important to focus there, because we often want to kind of, how do I get my students to understand this? And that is critical, but that is functioning to have us not look at ourselves as faculty, right? Whenever we ask, whenever someone asks, how do I? get so-and-so to understand this. I mean, that's important, but in that moment, the move you're making is the assumption, I already understand this. This is about getting, getting somebody else to, to get where I am. And we need to go back to where that relentless self-reflection, humility, um, and grappling, right? Where, where am I not understanding something, and how might I be accountable to that? Um, and so not just increasing the diversity of professors, but also requiring ongoing um, training and education. I think that racism is um, the most charged, the most complex, the most nuanced dynamic since the founding of our country. And to think that we wouldn't need lifelong continuing education on it, I think is really problematic, right? Um, so, one of the challenges for professors or faculty is we don't tend to be lifelong learners, right? We tend to kind of be a little bit arrogant about um, what we know. And so anyway, you, you can see all of these. And actually, I know that um, your institution is um, working and struggling, right, to, to move this forward and is putting together a cabinet. Is that correct? A council, right? Um, and you know you can put pressure by how's that going and you know what's going on. Okay. And I think as that happens, um, the racism that's embedded will surface more and more. One of the other challenges to this work is that we think when we start to talk about it and then it starts to surface. Some, sometimes we think that us talking about it or caring about it or centering it is what's causing the problem. And I would say no. You you finally created a space for all that people have had to sit on and endure to come to the surface. That's, that people are seeing something open that makes them feel like this might be the moment when I can start being real about what's going on. And as that happens, then, then you're going to have to endure, the white, white people on campus are going to have to endure looking at the way we've been colluding and maybe not knowing it. And I urge us to put our efforts on not protecting each other's feelings, but, but remembering it is inevitable that I have been colluding. I'm colluding every moment of my life. Uh, I'm also trying as hard as I can every moment to counter it. But we can never be free of it. And so you're going to start getting tensions and conflicts and hurt feelings because the fundamental idea of the good bad binary hasn't been challenged. And that's how people are going to hear it. And, and the pressure, I'm sure you may have already been seen. Anybody see any of this already? <laughs> and so just, you know, you're going to have to stay true and clear and keep reminding. It's inevitable. It's good that we're seeing it. <laughs> if we can't see it, we can't interrupt it. We know that it's here. Okay. Oops. So um, yeah, this goes really fast sometimes. Hang on. All right. Um, so I want to give you a chance to talk in small groups. I don't want to spend my whole time talking at you, as I've pretty much done my last couple times here. So um, what are some of the strategies that whites use, and if you're white, that you use to maintain face and look good regarding racism here at the Evergreen State College, right? Present ourselves as open, as cool, as getting it, as down, however you want to frame that. Um, what, are some of the, what, are, what are your strategies, if you're white? Um, and if you're, if you're not, what are, what are some of the strategies you've seen? Okay. Um, how do you see whiteness manifesting in the classes, in classrooms? Um, what is welcoming and affirming here at, at Evergreen for white people? Now, there's going to be the obvious, easy response to that. It's really, really white. <laughs> but beyond that, right, there's more than that. Um, how do white people in our institution come together and maintain white solidarity? So white solidarity is the unspoken agreement amongst whites, white people that we will keep each other comfortable, uh, protect each other's racism, not hold each other accountable, that essentially will privilege 
uh, protecting each other's feelings over actually addressing racism, right? White solidarity, kind of maintaining the, strat the status quo. Um, and what would I have to give up, again, if um, you're white, you, you would answer it with an I, and if you're not, kind of what do you think white people need to, need to let go of um, in order to work, move forward? So these are, these are meant to be really personalized. Um, and maybe in groups of three to four, the bigger the group, I know that it can be really comfortable to just gather right who's in your row, but the bigger the group is, the easier it is for some people not to participate. And you know, that's, uh, it's always, I think, I think it's important that we try to get everybody to, to put their voice in. So the smaller the groups are, the more likely that's gonna happen. But let's take about um, 10 to 15 minutes to talk through those questions, right? Again, if you're white, you, you, okay? Do folks feel ready to come back? Yeah? You wanna come back? I w I'm hoping there's so much resource in the group, right? And you know the specifics of, ev of I know I need to say the Evergreen <laughs> State. Um, so I want to capitalize on that knowledge. And so we have a couple people with mics, so I'd love for people to share any of their answers, that, again, to help us see how this manifests here, because if we can see it, we can interrupt it. So what kinds of uh, insights came out of your discussions? Anybody want to share? Is that, is that a hand? <laughs> um, just some, um, an example from your discussion of, of how, of an answer to any of those questions, you know, how you see it, it manifesting here um, or in yourself. Okay, and then over here, yeah. Hmm? Where's <laughs> How does whiteness manifest in our classes? Yeah. When students of color are threatened with physical violence Ooh. and then contact the police to report those threats of violence, the police inform that it is not a criminal matter, it is a student conduct issue. Then when the student goes to student affairs, they receive an email three hours later informing them that they are charged with disruption of college function. Okay. That's just one yeah. of multiple issues in my two quarters here. Yeah, thank you. I was thinking about when I was driving in that, um, the point that Bonilla Silva makes about the bucolic white town and what that feels like and the police force um, and all of that that often goes unnoticed by, by white people, you know, what, what faculty of color or administration of color are dealing with. And, and I thought, well, so what would I do? I'd like to think that when uh, my, my institution made a commitment to start ha hiring more racially diverse faculty and staff, I would actually have a meeting with the police chief. You know, the president of the college sitting down and saying there are going to be more, you know, da, 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 these are some of the patterns, this is implicit bias, I, you know, I really want them to be treated well, you know, use us as a resource, is there some kind of training we can give your officers on implicit bias? You just, you transparently go and you, and you talk to the different, uh, even the business association, right? You know, there are going to be people coming into your stores and your businesses that, that are different, right? That, um, where was I? Oh, I just did some work with the Oregon Shakespearean Festival. For 70 years, there were no people of color in the, in the cast, in the, in the organization. And so when you begin to have people of color, you're going to, all this stuff will surface. So you actually go, I just wanted to give you an example so we don't feel like there's nothing we could do, right? Okay. Um, did you want to make up? Is she, to talk about that, the, what came up is the silence uh, regarding, you know, whenever there is a discussion about race or racism, uh, there is a lot of silence from white people. Yeah, and one, I, um, the, 
the next part that you're going to get to talk about are um, some scenarios, and one of them has uh, lots of different rationales for white silence, and I, I, I wanted them in there because I wanted folks to grapple with. Um, some of this stuff just seems so, there's so many precious narratives that actually prote protect racism, like individualism and personal experience, and you know, I'm, I'm just an introvert, and I don't feel safe talking in large groups, and oh, as soon as I say that, then you're all gonna wanna protect me. And um, I actually think that when it comes to racism, I actually don't get to indulge in my preferred mode. And even if I am an introvert, it requires something of me different. So I wanted you to get a chance to kind of counter those those narratives. So I, I think silence is probably, well, if not the, it is one of the most powerful and hurtful uh, white modes in the face of this. It just, yeah, thank you. Others? Again, our purpose here is, th it's inevitable that this stuff is manifesting here. So this isn't to call out, <laughs> but to like help us see it so we can change it. Yeah, others? Yeah, over here, sorry. Um, having worked in recruiting both for Evergreen and then for the University of Chicago, um, one thing I noticed in terms of white solidarity is that um, even though they're very different settings, the recruiting strategy uses a lot of code words like safe, quiet, um, you know, serene, all these words that mean um, not urban, not diverse, so it's not just that Evergreen is really white, and that's why it's affirming and inviting for white people here, but Evergreen, like this, this area distinctly does not have people of color, where, um, which makes you feel safe if you're a white visitor. And then in Chicago, it's in Hyde Park, a historically black neighborhood in the south side, and much of our time as you know, tour guides and recruiters was saying it's here are all our safety measures. Here's how we protect our students, implicitly meaning white students, because our students of color were often, you know, assaulted by police officers on campus. So, um, that's that's my observation on that. And then I just want to say on strategies, one thing that I notice among in myself as well as my peers is that um, we use our other marginalizations to to sort of support ourselves. Is look, I'm aware of um, you know, I'm queer, I have these experiences, I know, this, I know the struggle, so I know that struggle, and I'm down with it, um, which is very much not true. Yeah, you know, and I think the key is how do you use your uh, oppression, right? And if you use your oppression to basically, it, I just have never known people of color to appreciate <laughs> some, a white person saying, I get it because, um, and so that's using your oppression to invalidate, right? But to use it to say, so what would it be like if somebody from this group said that to me? Uh, and you know, to use it to help you understand racism. And the reason I choose, I mean, I am a very strong feminist, and I think a lot of the ways that dominant society uses the term feminist is not feminism to me, right? Um, and I have a lot of energy about sexism and patriarchy and misogyny, and I choose to center race in my work because it's so much more difficult for me to identify where I've benefited from somebody else's oppression. I could tell you easily from a really early age all the ways I got less than, and so for me, that's the learning edge, right? Using it. And it does simultaneously um, help heal the places where, because I'm female and I grew up poor, I was told I was less smart than other people, right? All of that, right? So when I speak up about racism, not only am I using my position, but I'm healing the lie that I'm less than because of my other identities. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Oh. Um, I want to say something about that um, safe, you know, that in so many ways white people measure the value of our spaces by the absence of people of color, right? So the, the whiter it is, the more we position it as safe, right? And then when, when there are um, campuses that are in urban environments, and I, I can't think of the top of my head, but there are campuses that are like these huh, oases, right, in these really urban environments that those students get warned, do not go, you know, past this area. I don't know if you're aware of this, 
but I used to live in Springfield, Mass., and Springfield College is a very uh, expensive private college, and they get all the instructions about where to go and where not to go and how far to go off campus, right? So this almost this, this uh, under siege kind of... Um, and I actually just wrote a chapter in a book called um, Stop Telling That Story, Danger Discourse, um, and the reproduction of white supremacy. So uh, I had a class in the first day of class, it's an all white class, 100% white, because we were in Westfield, 10 miles from Springfield. Um, and we're doing a frame of reference exercise where we share some of the things that shape the way we see the world. I always start my classes that way. Um, and a, a white student tells a story about how she got mugged by a black man in Springfield. And I just was <laughs> like, why? Did you choose to tell that story here in this context? What does it have to do with anything? And I just started thinking about all the social capital that get it is accrued through a, a telling of those stories, and um, and made a case for you know stop telling that story. It might have happened to you. Tell it to the police or tell it to your therapist, but. But honestly, don't tell it in an all-white environment where it can only function to reinscribe white supremacy. So anyway, I, there's so much going on in that whole safe versus unsafe. Thanks for bringing that up. Others, yeah. Uh, thank you. I. One of the places that I notice whiteness is the way that when we talk about diversity and equity, it's different. So that means that everything else is not. And so my goal, one of my goals is to have diversity, equity, race be a part of everything. It's not what you do at 10 o'clock on the agenda and then you move on to something else. Uh, so my question, we started talking about attention that I feel a lot as someone who's trying to work on these issues, there is white fragility. People do, and I'm thinking of faculty, choose not to or choose to engage in this. They make the, that choice. How do I acknowledge the horror of racism and know that if I speak at that level, people will leave or not engage? And I want them to stay in the conversation. And it is, their white fragility is what's doing it. I think you know the tension. So it's a big question, but I've been wanting to ask you. I'm taking the opportunity. <laughs> it's the master's tools, right? Like you need them to stay in the conversation, but you don't want to coddle and reinforce and, um, I think it's those kinds of like the way that you keep them in is the is the you know oh I'm so glad you brought that up I've heard that before can you tell me more here's how you know so that kind of welcoming you, them to bring it to you so that you can kind of look at it sometimes just a question can be really powerful or yeah I used to I used to see that that way too and then somebody shared this and I you know so you're just kind of diplomatically but the um, the non-coddling is that you're, you're not letting it stop you, right? And that, that's the call. It, you're not giving up or going away. You're just trying to figure out how to, how to diplomatically keep them in. And keeping them in is an interruption to what they really want to have happen. <laughs> and it's, it's interrupting our stuff because my, uh, my socialization to avoid conflict was a raised poor Catholic white female is really strong, but it functions so beautifully to uphold racism, and so I have to challenge it, right? And so, so sometimes it's for you, right? It, you know, you, you, you can't control what the other person do. You're gonna do your best, but it's also really powerful to interrupt our stuff, right? Our, does that help? Yeah. And of course, if anybody else has thoughts on that, I welcome. Yeah.
Yeah. I know you probably resist that microphone, but the truth is I heard maybe half, because I am actually partially deaf, so. All right. Um, so while here, these are just a few of the things so far that I've complained about and been complaining about. I left once before as a guest student because my third time on this campus, I was accused <laughs> by Steve Davis, the emperor of Photoland, of stealing a studio light from which I still have never been in the studio. Um, but I've been, in, I've been threatened with physical violence by a student employee of the college. I've had my phone stolen from the classroom. I've had a student threaten me with physical violence, resulting in me calling the campus police and filling a request to press charges through the Thurston County Prosecutor's Office. After the officer that arrived initially didn't speak to me at all till the very, very last and spoke to the person that I um, called and then told me it wasn't a campus issue, even though they threatened violence against me, um, said that it was just a conduct issue. Um, I've been accused, well I already mentioned, been accused of stealing a studio light from the photography studio even though I still have never been in the studio. Um, I have on multiple occasions been yelled at and spoken to in an uncalled for manner by a member of the photography faculty. I was publicly embarrassed and told that I didn't have permission to use the digital imaging studio because my tuition wasn't paid even though I'm a retired vet that at the time was on voc rehab which means fees, everything was already paid for um, and that I needed to leave the class because I wasn't enrolled in it despite quick evidence which suggested otherwise. And then the Professor refused to listen to the VA that said that actually I was enrolled and I had to wait like a couple days before I could go back. Um, I've had a professor aggressively accost me and then lie to the police concerning the matter despite a witness from the Office of Sexual Assault and Prevention being there saying that I wasn't yelling at the police, I didn't threaten the professor. An official request was put in to ban me from Photoland less than 24 hours after I complained about damages done to my prints on bogus charges of misconduct, which I feel are retaliatory because of these issues I keep bringing up in my exhibits, my exhibits downstairs right now if you want to check it out. Well, I'm really sorry. Um, obviously, right, that, those are very deep uh, issues and dilemmas. I guess where I'm at, at is, is it, two thoughts come to mind, right? I want white people to develop a set of skills and perspectives so that we are in those situations with you really differently. Right, because that's a lot of what the challenge is. People engage from a very kind of defended place, from a not understanding um, the histories we bring with us, right? Not understanding the difference between intention versus impact. You know, all of those things, and so the, these incidences become much more painful and traumatic than they than they have to be. They often could be resolved really quickly if we had that those skills, but we don't. Right, we're not uh, we're not set up to have them. But then, of course, it serves us not to have them. So we, we need to challenge that. And then, other thought is allies. Right, like there are just times when you've got to have people that have a certain position and voice that can advocate for you and with you. Right. I mean, you may not always want that, but there are times when I'm sure you wish that there was a a strong white person who could get in there and be heard in a way that's different and help help mediate those situations, right? So we also have to build, build that too and it, it takes time and I'm just really sorry you're go dealing with all of that. Yeah. So maybe just one, one last um, way, you had some, you wanna talk? <laughs> I mean, as a faculty member, the, one of the major things I see is that we use the rhetoric of the founding as if we had it all figured out, and that we reacted against problems in the mainstream. And I can name two that I just think that they're too sacrilegious for us to even to consider. We eliminated academic departments, so what are the advantages and disadvantages for students of color of doing that? Our faculty hiring is done by faculty in general without really thinking about subject matter and the way we regress toward whiteness. And another one, which I almost hesitate to even bring up, is do our narrative evaluations and the lack of letter grades have a differential impact on our students of color when they have to go out and prove their validity of their degree in a world that's likely to not expect them to prove it. Um, so I think there's ways in which we set up to react against mainstream conformity, but we've created a new set of benefits and costs that oftentimes it's sacrilegious to even raise it as a discussion. 
Right, and I think you had shared like the founding and literally fathers, right? It, it was an alternative for privileged white kids who, who weren't successful, but it wasn't ever meant to be a racial justice kind of, um, you know, maybe social justice in that, you know, uh, eliminate capitalism, but not um, in looking at what our role is in relationship to other people, right? And so when we call back to that, it's kind of, it's maybe, I don't know, maybe this is not a fair analogy, but you know, calling back to the, the good old days or when things, the country was great, you know, I mean, any past era in this country is not better for people of color, right? Um, so who, who are we really, you know, calling up uh, when we refer to the, the founding vision, right? And how do we, how do we change that? Um, What do I have next? Well, just a couple of quick things. I think you 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 probably recognize, right? That that un inequity is always circulating. So the question it changes. It it becomes not if but how, right? So when you look at these practices like grades and things, if you used an equity tool like who's at the table, who will this benefit, how will people of color be impacted by this decision? I'm, I'm gonna bet those questions aren't on the table of every decision that gets made, is that correct? And, and it would change the way you think about what you do, right, if those questions were there. Um, understand our own positions within these relations, right, so not exempt ourselves. Um, think critically about knowledge, whose knowledge, how, how is, it, is it functioning, what is it serving? Um, we had talked in our group about, I, I uh, witnessed a panel discussion and there was a white man on the panel who's, who's very radical and he was saying, we just need to blow the whole system up, um, which was kind of fun to hear. And then a black woman said, excuse me, I'd like my children to get access to all the things you'd like to blow up before you blow them up, please. Okay, right? So that kind of not thinking about, you know, from whose perspective do we want to just eliminate and you know just that position of having having access and then choosing to to eliminate it and not thinking about would this narrative work for everybody <laughs> right um, oh okay here we go oh well it likes to go fast you know my um, a co co writer uh, with me, Uslam Sensoy, she's a professor at Simon Fraser. We have this metaphor of a, a basketball game because often we work with, with pre-service pre teachers and they always say, well, what, what do we do, what do we do, you know? And it's like, well, we could tell you what to do. Well, one, you're not gonna like it, right? I can tell you what to do, you're not gonna like it because it's nothing easy. It's all about kind of personal change. Um, and um, it takes time, right? So I could tell you how to play basketball and I could tell you the rules and then you're gonna get on there and you're not, you're, it, it's gonna be, uh, you're probably not gonna do very well, even though you know the rules because it takes strategy, it takes nuance, it takes awareness of your position in relation to every other player's position, right? I think it's a really great a metaphor for how you have to think about strategically about how to act towards racial justice, right? All right. So structures and patterns, humility, reduced defensiveness. Um, understand that how we respond to the world is driven by how we see the world. So when we change the way we see the world, we'll change our responses, which is why it's so important to me to keep kind of, let's keep exposing it, all the ways that are subtle if they benefit us, right? Um, teachers don't only impart knowledge on their students, they co-produce it, right? within a um, social historical framework. Right? So you're not just, you know, it's all happening out there. Um, developing meaningful cross-racial relationships, practicing and articulating both micro and macro levels, right? This is another reason why we wanna keep identifying this, not to make people bad. Um, I think I'm going to go ahead and share this because I think it could be useful as an example, right? Sometimes it's not that I'm attached to how somebody gives me feedback. I, I really don't think I am, and I and I work really hard, and I'm, I've, I 
I'm working really hard to get other white people to let go of how you get feedback <laughs> and just go for the feedback. But I want to also give an example of a dynamic that can happen. Uh, the last time I was here, I think one of the first people to ask a question was a young white man who right away, you know, pointed out all, all the problems with the setting, you know, how people were in the back and that meant they weren't committed and how um, I'm a white person, I was coming three times. And, you know, that, that's worthy to look at. Um, but in, in laying it out as if um, it had not been thought about, he was basically undermining the thinking of <laughs> your, your director of equity, a man of color, and me, uh, a woman with a doctorate in these issues, right? To, to, to assume that we had not ever thought about that is really to critique our, our intelligence, right? Um, and there's a deep history around that. This isn't just kind of a personal slight to me. There's a deep history about a people in a dominant group feeling you can think better for everybody. So the way to ask that, that, that has more humility and doesn't reinforce your own arrogance and dominance is, I'm noticing this, can you help me understand what your thinking was? You know, assume that Felix and I have some thinking <laughs> uh, and then ask us what it is. And you may not agree with it, but you don't come out of the gate as if we're, we, we're so superficial about how we're going to do this. Does this make sense? Yeah, go ahead over here. <laughs> Escape is not the same for everyone. So yeah. some people in the back of the room were standing there to get, get away if they needed to. Yeah. Right. For different reasons. Right. So not to, not to ask, right? And, you know, and, and asking can be powerful, right? That, that could be a strategy to, have, to kind of put people on the spot and without directly pointing your finger, kind of naming what they're doing, but, but you're thinking in that way rather than a, a, like, I'm going to get you because I can, I can see. Also, though, in that you're not actually naming how your own racism plays out, right? Um, which is usually what's the question. Okay. Um, and asking how this situation, this is, this is one that um, definitely I think applies to what you had shared. Um, how, does, how is history manifesting between us as we have this conflict, right? What history am I bringing? What do I represent to you? How might my very uh, race, class, position be triggering? right? What, what's getting invoked between both of our groups, right? We're not in a vacuum. And I think that if the people that were in these conflicts with you were thoughtful about the historical dimensions of, you know, accusing you as a man of color of stealing, right? Uh, that could have gone really different. But that is so charged. There's such a deep historical kind of relationship between my group and your group in terms of that alleged charge. Right. That damages a couple of my prints and hanging them up, and then more or less yells at me that I've been bothering her and getting up my exhibit when the stress of her week apparently made her later go and cry. That is grounds to be banned from Photoland. Yeah. So everybody's getting reinforced in their lynched you positions. Know, there are, are yeah. white women on campus, and if I look at them, I wouldn't like to think that I'd get lynched, but it felt right. very much like that kind of thing. Right. Right. It, that unacknowledged historical trauma that people of color in this water are constantly up against. So that it seems like one little thing from me, but it triggers the deep, deep history of violence and trauma between my group and yours, with my group perpetrating it <laughs> towards yours, right? But positioning you as dangerous to me, right? Um, Developing the courage and the stamina to hang in there when it's really uncomfortable and never consider your learning on this topic to be done. Okay, I think, oh, I got some more. No, I just sit in front of my computer and just go on and on. I'm going to go. Um, avoid channel switching. That was one that came up in our group, right? Um, wanting to, I often get asked, can you speak to all forms of diversity? Well, I'm not going to do justice to anything if I do that. And we're going to take race off the table. So, so no. And no discipline is outside these dynamics. I, don't, I, I may not be able to stand here. I could give you some ideas about how computer programming is related to race. <laughs> um, but um, just because I'm not, I haven't thought about it as much doesn't mean that it isn't. Okay. 
so. I'm, um, I think scenarios. Let's do some scenarios. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, as soon as race comes up on the table, then we want to let's talk about a different form of oppression. But what about class? Right? That's the real oppression. Why aren't we talking about class? Or everything's about race, we're never talking about gender, right? So now it moves it onto a, a different channel, um, which of course the question is always how does it function? And, and generally it functions to, to dilute and to, yeah. Because you could actually um, talk about those things together with race. Yeah, over here. I wish I had the slide in front of me. Oh, yeah. Um, I'm a faculty developer, and we talk about this a lot with our faculty for, at the State Board for Community and Technical Colleges. Um, I'm, I'm just going to wait for the slide to come up. That but last no one? discipline is outside of these dynamics and never finished. And I'm, I'm really hoping that maybe you could talk a little bit more about that. Like, how do we frame those conversations? Yeah, thank you. And that's what we're going to do now. So Felix is going to hand around. It's a, it's a one page on, uh, that has like five different scenarios um, and then a set of questions. You know, basically, how is racism playing out in these scenarios? Just tease it out as much as you can and then practice framing. And one of them is, but I teach computer programming. That has, this has nothing to do with it. And so I'm going to um, have all these people in this room put their heads on your question, okay? Because it's a key one, right? I mean, don't you have colleagues who you'd love to be here today and all the other ones that have been here, uh, you know, all your other talks, and uh, they don't come because they don't think it's relevant to their discipline? Okay, so we do need to know how to frame it, so we push back on that, so yeah. So go ahead and if you like the group you were in, great. If not, break into a different one or go, go to another one. Or if you just want a more uh, fresh perspective and not necessarily you didn't like your group. Um, and just to kind of work through those. And, and maybe for your group, go right to the one that addresses, I'm teaching math, you know. I tried to find scenarios that would hit a lot of the key ways it manifests.
Okay, you want ready to come back? <laughs> Welcome back. Let's let's start with the the really challenging one. <laughs> this idea that some some disciplines are outside of race. So let's just practice, right? I mean, it's hard, and so we don't have to be perfect. But what are some um, possible ways to explain that? And we'll just kind of wait for some folks we maybe haven't heard from. Okay, go ahead. So, um, so um, I'm a computer scientist. Oh, and yay. <laughs> Help us out. <laughs> so, yes, and I was just at a conference where uh, someone spoke about this. So the, um, and the question is, imagine, think in your mind of a computer scientist. What does that person look like? Okay, and just that question. And, and the idea that even people of color who come to this profession feel like outsiders because they have that image as well. And, um, and the, what, so the, the third point is the imposter syndrome. So many of us, especially in these highly technical fields that are always changing and you have to keep up to date, there's so much that we don't know that no one really knows the field completely. And so to think, oh, I'm an expert and I have the authority just is not comfortable for most people. And then it's even worse if you feel like, oh, then there's a good reason. Thank you. Yeah, I'm thinking too about the, um, well, whenever you're using examples or, or story examples or narrative, those types of things, you want to look at what, what kind of a s class and gender assumptions are in your examples, et cetera, but also, um, Implicit bias, right? When you picture the the computer scientist, not only do I see a white man, but I also see a South Asian man, right? And so um, all of the ways then that sets up, you know, um, this idea that we have diversity when we when we're not looking at also how how class informs who comes to this country and um, and who isn't seen or developed or where resources aren't put, etc. Right, just so so race manifests in, in that field in in a range of ways. Right, um, what about what are other ideas about how to help someone see that there is nothing free of race? Right, um, other ideas. You guys are going to make me worried. <laughs> yeah. How would you explain it to a professor? How would I explain it to a professor? Yeah, so I say to you, well, I don't really need to go to any of that diversity stuff because um, I, have like I teach home economics and we're just cooking, so that has nothing to do with race. Well, one thing that I really stressed in my business of art program to students was that if you were Jewish, if you were lesbian, if you were female, if you were Native American, if you were African American, if you were Brazilian, if you were from the East Congo, if you were Mormon, that you were only there because members of your ancestry fought to be there and they carved space out for themselves. And that space was only created through dialogue and discussion, some of which was very painful, some of which resulted in people hanging from trees, getting quartered, getting publicly raped, um, getting their careers destroyed and so it needs to be these issues need to inform every aspect of our education and particularly in the business of art there are many students in the program that tried to silence voices like mine but I reminded them of world art history and some of the current present day um, galleries that would not exist without the Basquiat's or would not exist without the Keith Herrings that made it a point of sleeping with African Americans, sneaking them into galleries, putting them in places and destroying um, white structures. So I think that that just has to, has to be actively sought to include 
in the dialogue and just people can't be silent. There's so, too many people that want to be silent and just fit in and it's just so damaging to, to try to fit in because you can eliminate your own space if you assimilate too much. This is helping me get my thoughts together on that, on how I would speak to it, right? So I might say, well, here's, here's how they're applying it to, to the medical industry. I know that you know, a lot of people in medicine would say, you know, race is not relevant, this is just science. And yet everything from how doctors interpret symptoms to how they treat symptoms to um, which research is funded, who is who are in research trials? How medicines are marketed? Right. I mean, you could just like every aspect. They have noticed racial disparity in the field of medicine. Now, I'm not a, aware of the racial disparity in the field of computer science, but I'm really curious. What What do you know about it? Have you ever gone? You know, what's the latest understanding? I mean, put it back on them. <laughs> Uh, I'd like to think it'd be really hard for the person to say it couldn't have anything to, after you've just laid out all the ways it plays out in medicine. Um, and if I had to, I'd probably go home and Google it and then say, hey, I just found all of these ways that they're addressing this in your field, too. It'd be so cool if you went to that with me and we could talk about it. Yeah, you had your hand up. Yeah? If the faculty member has a persona um, if the teaching identity, if his or her teaching identity is focused on a workforce paradigm, that you could say, well, what is the number of graduates? Um, like, what's the population? Of, what's the demographic of your field? Do you care mm -hmm. about making the number of computer scientists more diverse who are employable? Um, and my group members said it much more articulately than I just did. So. Yeah, and then there's that the next piece that they have to understand when they because they may say, well, of course, and I'm very welcoming in my classes. But then you can go to, oh, it's so exciting what we're what we're discovering now about implicit bias, right, and all the ways, right, that we may may think that we are. For example, you know, and you may give something from yourself, right. Um, I just have to, you know, again, I'm going to go home and look into it, but even maybe the way we design programs or what we design them for or what kind of bodies we're making assumptions will be using our programs or if we didn't have people with disabilities at the table, what all the technology that we wouldn't have because we wouldn't know, right? So there's... I think there's ways you could you could articulate, but but in a way it takes a little effort on our parts to educate ourselves in a field that we're not. But you know, if we got our eye on somebody that we want to move forward, you know, it might be worth it to us to do that. Yeah. Any other um, juicy parts of the scenario? Oh, go ahead. Yeah. There's. Um, I've, I worked in software for a year, so and I'm a huge nerd, so this yeah. is kind of a big part of my life. But um, I think. When, in terms of apps getting made, there was a really good article recently saying where someone was criticizing the fact, you know, if you look at the tech community in San Francisco and so on, they are, all of the startups that are getting funded, and here we go with getting funded, the startups that are funded are ones that are seen to have the possibility of being successful by people who are very much like the programmers, also wealthy, largely white people, in San Francisco, and they're the apps that are catering to the needs of that group. So they're the apps that are like making laundry or food or you know nightlife or all of these other things, um, like reinforcing those cultural behaviors, sometimes at the expense of people of color, instead of making apps for a far more diverse section of society that caters to the needs of people other than you know white men age 18 to 35. So. Um, the I, computer programming can't be exempt because it's an industry that relies on money and the money is coming from specific people and those people are making decisions through the lens of their racial bias. And the other example I thought of um, was the massive backlash that programs like Black Girls C Code has seen. Um, they're an amazing program. Uh, there are lots of different iterations, but Black Girls Code is basically teaching black women to code and getting them into that field in a training that, as both people of color and women, they are seen as fundamentally unfit for. And um, white people have gone nuts. There's so much hatred for this organization. Um, so there's just a tiny slice of racism in computer science. Yeah, actually, this, this is where I like um, putting, putting my head together with your heads, because I just thought of another one. Do you guys know about Gamergate? 
right? The incredible misogyny that came out of uh, something a, a woman gamer posted, right? I mean, those are examples like that. We're, oh, so I'm sure some professor here that you were trying to get involved would say, I would never do anything like that. It's like, yes, but we have to have the skills to address these things. And, and our students will be engaged in these kinds of interactions. And it's in the water. And so it's in everything that we do. So if you can, if you can invoke examples that, that you could clearly see that we need to know how to address this. We need to prepare our students, right? That, that can help. I'm also really grateful for this dialogue because I've been thinking a lot about program assessment and how oftentimes program assessment is really a stymied and convoluted process for faculty and for, for everyone. And I think part of it is because we don't have a lot of practice in thinking programmatically and we don't oftentimes think about our academic programs like who is our student population, how are we designing for them, what are the learning outcomes, and what's it like for a student of color or any student really to who look when we look at our demographics to navigate through that particular program. Um, so I'm just thinking, I mean, it's all connected, right? Your right. learning outcomes, are you just doing, you know, the standard, like, here's your 500-page textbooks with, textbook with three right. standardized assessments. So I think it's all kind of Yeah, and what, what's on the walls in your class, you know, classroom, and, you know, all of that, right? It conveys messages. There's so many multiple levels, yeah. Uh, yet I think also that um, uh, we have some things that are being done at Evergreen, like uh, we've done critical moments, uh, which the Washington Center has done, which is worthwhile maybe uh, for faculty to look at, too, or other faculty to look at. And we have the Native Cases uh, Project, the Enduring Legacies Project, which is also a, a, a really great uh, way um, to take different uh, different cultures, different ethnicities, uh, different races into account. So uh, some of those things are really good work and it would be great if some of that could also be supplanted into uh, the sciences more uh, where it is culturally appropriate curriculum. Thanks. Hey, on this, on the first scenario, certainly we're seeing the power of silence, right? But what's problematic about the woman who takes this coworker aside and says, hey, I'm so sorry that she said that? That seems like a supportive move. Did you identify what was problematic about it? <laughs> She's saying it in private, not to the person who's saying it, but to the person of color, like, hey, I'm on your side. But also, by not supporting in the large group, you're almost yep. like segregating or pushing them away and saying, I'm on your side, but we're just going to be quiet over here kind of thing, and reiterates how wrong it is, but they're not going to say anything to the person who's doing it. Right. It's like you get, you, you get to have it both ways. You get to maintain white solidarity. And then you also get to say, um, suck up basically to the person of color. And usually that person's response is, yeah, great. Where were you? Where, where I needed you was in, in there, right? OK. Um, what's problematic about the professor who says, well, students are going to have to take up the ball if, the, if you want that? Number four. She's dying to go ahead. <laughs> You're on the. Can you imagine that happening? Kind of saying, "Hey, look, I'm cover. I've got all this I have to cover." And if, okay. Well, I mean, that's a whole seminar in and of itself. But <laughs> um, something that came to my mind was uh, it's putting race outside of the classroom as extracurricular, not as central to the issues that are going on in the classroom. It's also putting the onus of knowing what to do on the students as opposed to participating in problem solving and coaching. And 
maybe there's more. I'm sure there's more. No, yeah, but no, those that, are the first two that came to my mind. And that's that's important for us to kind of recognize that it's also saying I'm not responsible for knowing this. You, I mean, if it's so hard that your professor can't deal with it, but you're going to have put that on the students, right? With no su support, if a professor that said that to me, I suppose I could say, okay, well, I, I guess I can bring it up, but I also am not going to expect this professor to back me up because obviously doesn't have the interest or the skills to do that, right? Um, and so it's it's silencing in so many ways. Um, and to this actually is an actual incident that came out of a law school um, asking students for microaggressions, right? So just picture your law professor who says, we're, we're not gonna talk about the racial dynamics in these cases. Any other just ones that you think are important to pull out in our last couple minutes? Because a lot of folks, when I moved around, said, yeah, these are, these are kind of almost comical. They're so classic, right? They're really recognizable. Um, so any piece that you want to make sure that we name? OK, somebody who hasn't shared, I'm going to hold out. I think this line, we can't fire people <laughs> for, what they believe, for what they believe, mm -hmm. is really poignant. Um, and for this institution, speaks to the amount of power that faculty have with the libertarian ethos of autonomy. I didn't fully hear you, and she, she wanted to clap, so it must have mean it was really, really juicy. I want to make sure I hear it. Say it again. Okay. The line about not being able to fire somebody over what they believe yeah. struck me as really poignant. Yeah. Um, and for this institution, relevant in so far as we have this libertarian ethos where faculty autonomy is really privileged. You know, the, the, I used to get this a lot with future teachers around, uh, God, they would use the term homosexuality, I don't like that term, but right, about, well, look, I'm personally against it, and you, you know, that's my beliefs, and that's my religion, and it's like, you know, and yeah, there's, uh, I can't make you agree or disagree, I hate to even use that language of agree or disagree, but nonetheless, um, but when you're here, you are required by your job to create an atmosphere in which all children can learn, right? Your job is to provide education for everyone. And um, when you don't address these issues, you are creating a hostile environment when some students cannot learn, right? So you can believe whatever you want, but when we're here, we're going to use an eight racial equity approach um, we're gonna we're gonna grapple with it. We're gonna use it in our decisions. We're gonna struggle with integrated into our curriculum, because you work for an institution that that's what we're doing, right? I, I often use if I was working for a therapy organization and they use the Gestalt method, then when I'm at work I have to use the Gestalt method <laughs> when I'm doing therapy for them, and then I can go home and do my other other ways, right? When, you know, so. Um, that idea that this is trying to control people's thinking, no. But um, not addressing these kinds of attitudes does affect people's abilities to learn, and that is part of your job. It's, it's a theoretical framework, just like any other theoretical framework, but that's the one that we're, this, this institution stands behind and that you're going to have to grapple with. Right? So uh, maybe that might be a great note to end on, right? <laughs> so thank you so much.